Hi everyone, John Huvenas from the AO Show. Today joined by Matt Trelope from ozopen.com and Simon Ray from the Game Insight Group. And today we're going to be discussing the Indian Wells Women's Final, where for the first time in history, we saw an inverse result of the Australian Open Women's Final. Elena Rabaikina triumphant in straight sets over Arina Sabalenka. She did that 7-6, 6-4, after the AO final in which Sabalenka won in three, four, six, six, three, six, four. And today, gentlemen, we're going to unpack how she did that. We're going to look at three elements, the strategy, the emotions, and finally, the execution. And so, Simon, we're going to tap into your insights brain and Matt, your journalistic brain, to try and put together the pieces and work out how this all happened. Because back before the Australian Open, it was a different story as we went into this match, Simon. Yeah, hi John, hi Matt. Good to be with you guys. Thanks for the opportunity to get together again and, and talk about these two superb female athletes that are absolutely at the top of their game right now and are really stamping themselves as looking to hunt down Iga Swiatek and um, remarkable performances from both of them to start the 2023 campaign. Mm. I was really interested listening to your chat, the two of you on the podcast a few weeks ago, where you talked about both Sabalenka and Rabakina. They have similar weapons. They're both high up on, you know, among the women in terms of serve speed, forehand speed, forehand heaviness, backhand heaviness. And you basically said there's really nowhere to go against either of them. And it's overwhelming. You're faced with a barrage. So as someone that's coached at a high level before, Simon, like, what would you tell your player? Where do you go? What weakness do you try to target when that kind of onslaught is coming at you oh, well, across the net? I think it's a great question, and it's not easily answered, Matt. So you you really put me on the hot seat there. I, I think um, you know trying to identify any type of weakness in these two outstanding athletes at the moment is easier said than than done. And one thing to come up with a plan, another thing entirely altogether to be able to execute that plan under pressure and and to get the job done. Sabalenka in the first set of the AO final, making contact with that second serve return inside the baseline. 38% of the time in set one. Set two, though, stand by, get ready for this number, 83%. Okay. So it's gone from 38 to 83 to 80 in the final set. Rebikina, by contrast, 57. She stays high in set two, 78, and she's right down in set three, 36. So in my mind, it's that notion of the steam train gathering momentum, Sabalenka. You know, she loses the first set, and in her mind, she's going, look, I might go down here today, but if I do, I'm not going to die wondering. I'm going to go down on my terms. I'm going to take the fight to my opponent. And I think when Sabalenka is at her best, to answer your question, there's no really easily identifiable weaknesses. Um, one thing that does come to mind, if you can put these two women on defense, if you can find a way to get them behind in the point, sure, perhaps you can expose them. But good luck doing that, given the heat that they're bringing on serve and the intent that I've mentioned that both of them are bringing from a returner serve perspective. So you can do that through playing first strike tennis. Perhaps if you're an Ash Barty and you're gloriously talented with a sublime skill set, you can do that through the use of a slice backhand and changing gears and being a little more nuanced in your approach. But, hey, the world of women's tennis at the moment, that they don't have any answers for what these two are bringing. And so they're stamping themselves as, as contenders for Grand Slams in the short and medium term, in my mind. If we leap forward to Indian Wells, I think a lot of people, thought maybe the answer to that question when Rabakina came up against world number one, Iga Svantec. That was another Australian Open rematch. We saw Rabakina beat her in the fourth round. They came up in the semifinals. People thought maybe the slower court, Iga was playing better. She could get Rabakina on the move. You said she was not as good defensively, but we saw Rabakina beat Iga 6-2, 6-2. Wiped, wiped her off the court. And um, I guess, and so then that set up this um, sabalenka Rabakina yeah. rematch, um, which is only the third time that's happened ever at Indian Wells in a women's final, but this time the result was different. So when you were saying all those things about Sabalenka, like, you know, there is no weakness, doesn't want to die wondering, really amped up the aggression when she was a set down, she found herself in the same position in this Indian Wells final, but didn't win. So what um, maybe did Rabakina do differently that turned this rivalry on its head? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. And I think one of the, the real strengths of the Rabakina game, uh, perhaps in comparison to Sabalenka, I suspect Sabalenka at her very, very best may have a slightly, a marginally higher ceiling than Rabakina right now. But I like that notion of Rabikina's repeatability and consistency of performance. And you can even see that in the two athletes out on court, which kind of leads us into one of John's themes for the day in, in, in terms of mentality or emotionally being able to handle the, the ups and downs and the topsy-turvy nature of the contest. So we were chatting before we started to record about Sabalenka, I think, coughed up 17 double faults back in that Australian Open final. And we were all kind of surprised to think back at that number being so high. But 10 in the first set of this Indian Wells final is a bit of a different ball game altogether. 
And it was certainly a different ball game in terms of how she handled that emotionally. And you saw, I think, quite a rock to Rina Sabalenka come out early stages of set two, unable to perhaps park that emotional baggage. Now, how much of that is due to the Rebikina game and, and no easily identifiable or recognisable weaknesses? I think plenty of it. And Rebikina, again, despite the differing conditions in Indian Wells, a lot more lively and the ball's jumping off the court, she's rock solid. And I reckon she'd made more of a plan or more of an intent to, hey, look, I'm going to return aggressively in this match. And Arena, you're not going to push me back this time. So you might be coming at me. It's going to take, come hell or high water, I'm not moving back off the baseline on second serve return this time. So, And what we saw was that real consistency of performance from her. 67% of her second serve return points won in set one. Rebikina, 67% of her second serve return points won in set two. So that so real there was consistency. no drop-off. Uh, there wasn't a change. She maintained her returning prowess, I guess, Absolutely. throughout the match, which Absolutely. didn't quite happen. As opposed the, to, yeah, it was yes. 31% less than that in the second set of the AO final, yes. at 36%. Yeah, I think there was a, a really steely resolve in the eyes of Rebikina in this match to, we spoke about Sabalenka's want to play it on her terms in the AO in sets two and three, no matter the result, no matter the outcome. And I think Rebikina had almost learned that lesson from the opponent in the AO final and thought, well, I'm gonna give you a little taste of your own medicine. I'm not going to change today. So I'm going to continue to dominate your second serve. And I'm going to continue to send a message that I'm coming after that. And I'm going to continue to be rock solid off both wings from the back of the court. And we know Arena's a little more volatile. We know Arena's capable of throwing in some more double faults. And by contrast, Rebikina, rock solid emotionally, rock solid tactically throughout the contest. And I think that was the decisive factor for me. It's almost that competitive mindset, sure, but the ability to maintain that competitive discipline and that steely resolve throughout the contest, there was no fluctuation from Elena Rabakina in the final at Indian Wells. And I think one under-discussed element of this is Rabakina's serve. We talk about Sabalenka's serve, how on it is or how off it is with the double faults, but Rabakina was the premier server at the AO. She had the fastest speed. She only had two double faults in the Indian Wells final. Maybe there's a perceived pressure there for Sabalenka that if my opponent, Rabakina, is holding serve more comfortably and is more stable, there's more pressure on her serve even forgetting the return. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And the numbers would bear that out. So, you know, set one of the AO final, where obviously Elena Rabikina is the victor in set one, 75% mm. of the second serve points won from mm. the Rabikina racket. Yep. In set two, that plunges. She's down at 44%. And in set three, dips down even further again, if you can believe that, down to 29. Mm. Now, her numbers are not super high or astronomical at, at Indian Wells, but they're certainly higher than arenas by comparison. Okay. So 57% in set one of the second serve points one off the racket of Rabikina, 44% one in set two. So whilst there's a dip there, yeah. there's not a not plunge as off the cliff. Yeah, mm. so that notion of the steam train of, of Sabalenka mm. gathering momentum in the AO, it was like, well, the steam train came up against the immovable object this yeah. time, and yeah. Rabikina wasn't going anywhere. Mm. Adding to those differences was the fact that they have played a tie break in the first set of the Indian Wells final, yeah. and it went to 13-11, yeah. something we didn't get anywhere near in the AO final. From an emotional perspective, how did you rate or analyse Sabalenka and Rabikina? I watched it. It was one, it was incredibly tense because the quality was really, really great. But then I feel that Sabalenka's second serve deserted her, well, her serve deserted her in the tiebreak and a lot more double faults came and they came on crucial points. But I don't, even though maybe that technically is not the highest quality, it was still incredibly compelling. And the tennis that had gotten us to that point was excellent. It actually was a real continuation of the AO final, I thought. And that's why everyone was so excited to see them play again. But yeah, it really felt like the the kind of a little bit of those yips that had plagued Sabalenka in 2022. Shades of that returned. Her reactions were interesting to them. She laughed after a couple of them, which I thought is a, quite a good sign that she's able to stay at least a little bit yeah. relaxed. We but saw a little bit of that in Melbourne. We too. saw a little bit of that in Melbourne too. But um, the players traded a lot of set points. I think they might have had three or four each. But to me, watching it, it just felt like Rabakina was going to win it. Um, every time Sabalenka stepped up for a, a first serve, and you could hear it in the crowd as well, they'd... There was that murmur when she missed her first serve. I was less confident in her second serve in this match than I was in the Australian Open match. And Rebecca and I probably felt that too. And she scraped through it. I think that was illustrative of what was going on. I think it's a great pickup and a point really well made. And, you know, you've both identified that notion of almost smiling after the double faults, which I, I personally quite like. That notion of, you know, you, you're sooner to laugh at something than cry about it <laughs> under pressure. And I think that's her coping mechanism, if you like. But what was concerning in a couple of those moments, or there was a really stark difference for me, again, in terms of her approach at the Australian Open versus what I saw in, in the desert there in California, 
really, if you're going to live by the sword, die by the sword, in the way she did down here in Melbourne in that final, and what an outstanding performance, and I think she's received the, the plaudits she rightly deserves um, from it. But then the sword got put right away in Indian Wells in that first set tiebreak. It was nowhere to be seen. Back in the scabbard. Yeah, exactly. And I think it was a couple of those um, those double faults were actually made with a real lack of intent or lack of purpose. And those are the ones that are halfway up the net without the type of acceleration or purpose or intent on the ball that we did see from her down here in Melbourne. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's double faults and then mm, there's, and double, there's faults. double faults. Yes. And those ones that I saw in Indian Wells in the first set tiebreak are the type of double faults that you really don't want to be coughing up mm. under pressure. And I think she did, yes. I think she referenced that in her post-match press conference, which at least shows that she's aware of it, yeah. has done all the biomechanical work on the serve, which got it to a better place in the first place. Yes. So at least she's definitely got somewhere to go from there and, and a technical change she can make. Revert back, she, to yeah, plan revert back to plan yeah. A. Yeah. We have now, over the past few months, seen the emergence of a brand new rivalry in women's tennis that uh, few would have seen coming uh, before the summer. Uh, Igish Viontek is still obviously there right at the top and made it through to the semifinals. But how significant is it for tennis to have two power hitters who've worked their way to a major final and now a, a sort of a big event, the big, one of the bigger events on the tour um, in, within the space of two months? It's super significant because that's the thing that women's tennis has been missing for a long time. There is incredible quality on the tour. All of the ingredients are there to make the game great. But the one thing that's been missing is they've either never been healthy at the same time or a few of them lose early so you never get the meeting playing each other consistently in the biggest matches at the end of the biggest tournaments. And that's what's happened here. The two biggest finals of the year have been contested by the same two players. A story can come from that and people look forward to the next edition of the match because they enjoyed the previous one so much. So everyone was very excited about this. The other thing that's great about those two is that as dominant as fiontech has been, she's wary of Sabalenka and Rebecca and they can trouble her. We've seen that already. Their power robs eager of a lot of her weapons. So it's for anyone that says one player dominating all the time is boring. Well, that's not happening on the women's tour because eager might still be winning the bulk of matches, but she's not a lay down as there to win every match, particularly if they're still there. So now you've got them. They're the top three in the race. They're meeting consistently on at the biggest tournaments and it's really interesting to see how they grapple with each other and and it's the consistency we've been missing. We're seeing that now pretty much ever since Rebecca won Wimbledon and then Sabalenka started recovering kind of towards the back end of that season. They've really been in the conversation now for more than six months. So if that can continue, that'll get people invested. I, I certainly love watching that. Yeah, I think it's fascinating and I think it's a... You know, Matt's um, illustrated it and talked to it really well. I think it... Um, highlights a real story to watch. Again, if we if we hark back 12 months, Swiatek was absolutely and totally dominant, and and kind of in the midst of that, or at the start of that phenomenal run. And I think it speaks to that notion of continuous improvement at the very top of the sport, and how important it is. And what we've seen here in Sabalenka and Rubikina is that notion of they've gotten better mm -hmm. over the last 12 months, and they've, you know, if not totally bridged the gap, they've certainly narrowed it. And in certain circumstances, well. It was dominant the other yeah. day, wasn't it? Rebikin over Swion Tech. So now the ball's back in Eager's court, if mm. you like. She's got to go away and recover some of that momentum. And we were used to, across the course of 2022, Swion Tech's defense getting it done against mm. these type of ball strikers and this type of weaponry coming at her, but not at the moment. So I think there's a watch mm -hmm. on it for sure with the um, remainder of 2023 in mind. It bodes well for a very exciting remainder of the year. Matt Trelope, Simon Ray, thanks for joining us on the AO Show. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. Thank thanks, you. Guys. <laughs>